Well, let me say thank you once again for being here today as we, uh, uh, we've, we've been praying and preparing for really what, what I don't know, we, we, we're, just, we're just trying to see what God's doing right now. And I feel like sometimes, uh, even, even last night as I was working on my message, um, he's not like he's far off. He's not like he's, he's just there dictating and telling you, you know, but he, he, is, he is leading us and guiding us. And, and, and the question is, are we, are we willing to, to, to put our sails up and follow him? When we came to, when my wife Stacy and I were interviewing, actually, we had our uh, interview back here when we came uh, almost, uh, it's almost three years ago, uh, uh, two months, two years and 10 months or something like that, when we started the journey and uh, we huddled around our computer in this, I had, in one of our rooms at our house in Toledo, we made this little makeshift studio and and I had um, our computer and, and the 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 pastoral search committee was, pulpit committee was doing some questions and uh, they were going to ask us and interview us at that point. And uh, I remember at, uh, that right around that time, I, I, my wife had brought home a, uh, a little thing for my wall. And it's on my wall in my office today. And we, we brought it up that, that night when we were, that afternoon, it was a Sunday afternoon when we had the, the, the time and, and it was right behind us on the wall and it was this, it's a metal ship with the, the sail up. And it says on there that we may not, we, we can't control the wind where it's going to blow, but we can put our sails up. We have the choice to put our sails up. And that's the choice that we have of, you know, last week I talked about being witnesses of how we take what is what God's doing here at these altars. The purpose God is moving is to one, wake up the church the sleeping giant to what he wants to do. Some of you have been praying for a move of God for, for decades. And, and I don't know, like, I, I want to encourage you that, like, I, I feel like this is just a trickle of what is yet to come. Because I don't feel like this is the fulfillment of, it's, we're not at the place of fulfillment. And, and this week I, I watched, if you watched anything that was going on in Asbury, the college down in uh, Wilmer, Kentucky, where, uh, you know, where we've started to see this, this move happen. Uh, we, were, we got home Thursday night after setting up with, uh, helping set up with the ladies event. And um, uh, I, I pulled up the, the live feed. And Stacy was sitting on the couch over on the other side, and I was sitting in a, a, a chair. And and I'm on my phone. I'm just listening. And there, and there are it's a, a, a United Methodist Church, okay. And so I, I've got a lot of friends that are great United Methodist pastors and friends, and go to those church. And it's not. And and they're saying this isn't about the United Methodist Church. It's bigger. And here are these guys, I mean, and, and the testimonies, they had all these testimonies of students and saying, um, you know, that while they were there at the services, they, some grew up as pastor's kids and some of these things and the, the level of anxiety and fear and all this stuff that was in their life. And they're testifying to God delivering them of this fear. And I think it's, it's, it's powerful because here, we, we've all, I mean, everybody in this room, we understand wh where things have been the last three years through COVID. I mean, we, we see, we're seeing the residuals of that in our kids that maybe you have young kids and they're having a hard time talking because they didn't get the formulation to be able to see how words are formulated all the time because of the mask. And no matter where you were at in the whole thing, and I don't care where you land politically, there's stuff still coming out. There's announcements that are, came out this morning already and all this stuff of how it's happening. And if you want to believe every conspiracy theory in the world, I don't care. But what's happened is it's formulated this level of anxiety and fear and worry about what's the unknown about what's coming. Well, if they can do this, and if a balloon can fly over 60,000 feet, like what else is happening? What else is going to take place? I, I just remind you still that no matter how high that balloon is, it's still, the, the word of God says that the earth is his footstool. <laughs> and as high as that balloon, they're like, we don't have anything in America that can get to that place or whatever, all these things. But remember, if the earth is his footstool, how great and big is God? 
And so all these, these students were testifying to this place of deliverance and Tracy, even so much of the joy that was, you spoke of and shared in testimony. And I understand the spirit of an abandonment. I mean, when, when I dealt with that in college, man, I like, oh my gosh, it was so powerful, and I, I, I went to I went to the altar and responded. And one of my mentors was was back, and he was reading a paper of some sort, and there was such a freedom in it that I like turned around and just ran back and buried myself in him. He's like, "What in the world's going on?" But I buried him myself in him because there was such a a freedom in that. And for me, it was this story of writing a letter to my dad and, and working through some of that stuff and the tears filling those places and, and, and that. And, and, and let me tell you, friend, like, I just want to assure you, number one, that I don't officially have a clue of what God's doing, <laughs> if that's all right. Um, but I can say this, that our team, our leadership, our staff team is hungry and willing for God to move. We start our staff meeting with prayer and this week we came in and I turned on some music and, and uh, we gathered and our normal half hour turned into like an hour and we just talked and then, and then we went into, we went into the, we go into the uh, coffee shop and, and sit around tables and, and have a conversation about where we're going and Grant's been there with us and talking through these things and, and the conversation of what's happening at the altar. And then the conversation of saying, like, I asked the question, I said, on my side, I'm like, how do we steward what God's doing? I mean, you've been places where you've gone to do things and while you're there at those places and, and maybe friends or, or uh, you're staying at somebody's house or whatever and you don't feel welcome. Like, that's not what I want for the presence of God. That's not what I want to happen here at our church. I want God to look in this place and look upon us and say, wow, there's a people that are open to my move, open to what I want to do. And so in the, the let me tell you, there, there's no, there's no like rule book. I mean, there is, we have God's word and we see how he's moved. But we, we on our side, we're just trying to stay I think less as you shared and, you know, with God soften our hearts and then let them stay soft. And how do we follow the leading of where God's moving? Number one, I just want to encourage you this morning that, that as leaders that I know that some of you want it, but we want it even more. <laughs> like, like, see, like I, I get it. I'm like this. I know you, and you expect, well, you pastor, you're the pastor. And I said, but it's not just for being the pastor. It's for us as a church that God wants to move. And what we've been experiencing the last couple of weeks is, has really been, a lot, a lot of places aren't seeing it. And a lot of places, um, I mean, I, I can't speak to the, the place of the pastor, but I can, I can speak to the office of the pastor. And there, even with Asbury and everything going, there's groups of people that are questioning what God's doing and saying, well, that's not God. And I'm like, wait a minute, a bunch of teenage, teenagers, college kids that are not on their computers, video games, not at the bar, not at doing all these other things, but they're showing up in line. Right? They're, they're showing up for lines to... To, to do it. I mean, at Brownsville days when we were at Pensacola, I mean, people would line up for 13 hours and not end up in the main sanctuary. We ended up in the chapel or a choir room or a tent or not even, you didn't even make it in the tent. You were outside the tent. She was in a bush outside the tent. <laughs> But, 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 there was this, but there was this hunger and a stirring that was taking place. And, and that there was, I mean, I went to Pensacola and people were like, oh yeah, you're going to go to Pensacola. I'm like, we went to the beach the first day. I got so fried. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Pale Red, you know, white, red, you know, whatever. At that point I was lobster and then I got baptized uh, in the water. And then I, I put on clothes and I just had to, I, I, I took corduroys to Florida. I remember that. And I wore corduroys and long sleeve shirt and laid underneath a, a construction uh, trailer because I was out of the sun. 
Because I was so like, don't touch me, don't touch me, don't touch me. But that's what, we, that's what we did for our spring break. Like, and, and, I, and I, I, I say that because the office, the office of the role of the leadership of the church, God, Ephesians 4, God's given the leadership of pastors, apostles, teachers, prophets, and evangelists as, as leadership gifts to the church to, to work together to, to lead and to steward what God wants to do. And, and there are those that are standing in the pastoral seat uh, role and have a title that, that are very afraid of, uh, of, what, of things getting out of control. I have friends that schedule their service down to the minute of what's going to happen. And then it's followed. There's a, there's a stage manager off to the side that's managing and keeping everything flowing and moving so that those can do and they get through where they're supposed to get through. And I, I just want to each their own and that's what they want to do. And, but I, I want to let you know that it, that's, that's not where, we, where I stand and where we stand. I want to be in a place that we're fluid and ready for God to move. And we're willing that if he tells us to go this direction or that way, that we can pivot in doing it. And, and I tell you, that's not as a sign of weakness and saying we're not preparing because I think I've prepared more for this week than, mentally and spiritually than I've prepared in a long time. Because I want to come into this place and be like, I don't want to miss what God is going to, wants to do. And I want to make sure that my heart's in the right place so that when he does speak that I'm willing to go. And I'm willing to do and lead. And so I want you to know today of the confidence that, that we in the place where we're leading from right now, just saying, God, if you'll, if you'll speak, if you'll show up, if you'll move, we'll go, we'll do, we'll be who you want us to be. And, and maybe that's not where you're at today, but I want to ask you the question. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, can you deny the presence of God? Amen. The thickness in his presence. Because I, I, I don't want it to be like we're, we're talking about some mystical individual that's far off. Because really, if you've been in this place, you've sensed his presence so near. I was getting ready to well, I was thinking about my sermon for this morning, and I, I still have the one I wrote for two weeks ago. And I should have been finishing a series today. <laughs> but, hey, it's over there, and I'm just like, ah, it's just not where we're supposed to be at. And I called Pastor Darren and talked to Heather, and we're talking through some of these things, talked to Matt a little bit. And then uh, as I was working on tearing down the ladies' uh, at the, the event hall yesterday, I just something started to stir in my spirit and, and something really that the Lord has been working on. I, I'm doing my Bible reading. Uh, we're doing a daily Bible reading. I encourage you to pick them up today for this next month. I'm doing a, a, a different one than that, but I just encourage you, get through the Bible this year. Read through it. Pick a chronological. Pick a, just read through it. There's, the list is out there. Just do it. And uh, I've been reading through in this past uh, couple weeks and chronologically, I'm in Leviticus, which some of your, uh, Jenny, you said, oh, I just, you know, and I, I thought about that, and this week I've really been enjoying Leviticus, so I was like, praise God. I said, I guess I'm growing up a little bit. I don't know. But I'm at this Old Testament place where God met with the Israelites during the wilderness journey. This morning, open up your Bible to Numbers chapter 9, and you're like, you're going to preach out a, a message out of Numbers and Leviticus. Come on, if God can move in Kettering out of Leviticus and Numbers, bless the Lord, right? We're talking about dry kindling here, right? <laughs> Easily to start a match, that's our match to it. But there's been a stirring in my spirit about what God wants to do and how we're supposed to steward this move. One of the things that we can see out throughout the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and the being in Numbers is that the Lord was giving instructions to the Israelites in how they were to live and how they were to worship. 
He's laying these things out. And as we see from Exodus 19 through Numbers 9, verse 14, they're, 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 this is what he's laying out. But there comes upon this place uh, in that time where there is a pause for the Israelites in the journey. They're coming out of Egypt. God's promised to Abraham that, you know, he's promised that there's the promise land. Moses, that the promised land is coming. All these things. And he's supposed to lead the people. But God pauses the Israelites at Mount Sinai to give the Israelites his instructions for worship, holiness, the rituals to gain purity again. And once again, how the camp was to be laid out. So in this portion of scripture from Exodus 19 through Numbers chapter 14, uh, chapter 9, I'm sorry, we see in there that Moses in Exodus 19 was at Mount Sinai. And God was speaking to him. And, and so what does it say in verse 18 to 20? You don't have to go there, but you may want to write. I got a lot of verses today I want to share with you. It says, now Mount Sinai was all smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke. And God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. There was a place of meeting that God had. We see in Exodus chapter 20 that while Moses is up there, the Lord gives him the, the Ten Commandments, and it begins to lay out what the Ten Commandments were. Other things that took place in this portions of Scripture here in these, these verses and chapters, that we see the Sabbath is laid out, the seventh day of rest for everybody, the, the rights that were given for the land, the animals, and relationship. There was a covenant that was established between the Israelites and God. There was also the laying out out of the tabernacle and the elements and I'm not sure if we have that or maybe it's being worked on up there but the, the tabernacle that was there and, and, and in that tabernacle we see all the elements that were laid out. First off speaking of the Ark of the Covenant which was the, the place where inside the Ark of the Covenant was the, the uh, Aaron's rod as well as the, the uh, Ten Commandments were laid in there but the Ark of the Covenant was, a, was placed inside of the Holy of Holies. It was a, a place where God would, where, where the, the priest would come into. The only the priest could go in. And it says that there was a curtain up to, they believe, three feet thick outside of that. That when the priest went through, it was because, and the priest went through with a rope on his leg. And he had bells, there was bells around the bottom of his, his uh, tunic or his attire, that he, his priestly garment and robes that he would wear. And they said, they, and the reason why the, the thickness of the, the, the veil was because it had multiple layers and they had to push their way through as the priest to get through. And if anybody that was entering that place and saw the Ark of the Covenant that wasn't holy, their life would be taken from them. And so he had to push his way through, believing that through the tabernacle, the, the Ark of the Covenant was the end, but the beginning was the brazen altar where a sacrifice had to take place. And it had to go, all, all the altars and, and the table of showbread and, and the, 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 the candles and everything like that, all the way through to the priest getting into that holy place. And and even before that went in, it said in, in Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, it says, there I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, was, so on the Ark of the Covenant, um, I think we have a picture of the Ark of the Covenant when it comes up, but uh, there it is. So the Ark of the Covenant, this was carried uh, on the shoulders. It would go with the men and women as they went through, but the doves, uh, the angels on top, and it said there would be a blue flame that would go back and forth in between that would represent the presence of God. And so there was inside this holy of holy place, and in there it says that, that I, will, I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the Ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I give you in the commandment for the sons of Israel. The glory of the Lord. The, so the priests would kind of, there would be uh, incense and the incense and the smoke would begin to fill that room because even the, the high priest walking into that space to see that element and the presence of God 
was very dangerous. And I, I told you there was a rope on his leg and bells. And, and the reason for the thick thickness of that curtain, because as he made his way in there, he was, he was seeking forgiveness and, and atonement of the sin of the people of Israel. And when he pushed through that curtain, the, uh, there would be other priests that were allowed, and they would, they would put their like, ears up to the curtain to listen for the bells. Because if the bells stopped moving, it means that the priest, the high priest had died and that God did not accept their sacrifice. And, they, and nobody else could go in there, so that was why the rope, and they would pull him back out. But God, in this portion of Scripture, do you have the uh, picture of the tabernacle? It's for me there. This is the, the tabernacle, and I'll show you. I have other pictures in a moment, but it starts with the altar of in offerings or the altar, the brazen altar, has the laver, which is the washing. It moves, so this is the outer court all the way over to the side. The holy place or the inner court here in the middle, you have the table of showbread or shoebread, the menorah, the candlesticks, and then the altar of incense. They would, uh, they would grab, the priest would grab the incense off there, fill the incense holder, and he would begin to sprinkle. I grew up Catholic, and so I understand what that looks like. You know what I'm talking about? You've seen it happen maybe. And put that, get the presence in that room to protect the bench, the Ark of the Covenant with the Shekinah glory in the Holy of Holies. That God was moving. And so the, throughout this portion of scripture here from Exodus, uh, from Exodus, we see 19 uh, through Numbers 9, we see God laying out the Ark of the Covenant and the table of showbread, golden lampstand, the brazen altar, uh, the altar of incense. But in this portion of scripture, we also read about the golden calf. And we see about how Moses went up the Mount Sinai for the intercession of the people and how when he came down, the glory of the Lord was all upon him and his face was so bright that they asked him to veil his face because he had been with God talked about the cleansing in this it talked about the tribe of the Levites how they were called to be the temple caretakers and the priests of those times and that leads us up now there, there's a, a shift that happens in numbers numbers chapter 9 that takes place because now it's not about the rules and the regulations and what it's going on but it shifts to what's about as they're getting ready for the next season numbers 9 verses 15 through 23 it says now on the day that the tabernacle was erected so the tabernacle was this tent, okay? It had a tent around it, and it was movable, all right? On the day that the tabernacle was erected, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony, and in the evening, it was like the appearance of fire over the tabernacle until morning. So it was continuously, the cloud would cover it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was lifted from over the tent, afterward the sons of Israel would then set out, and in the place where the cloud settled down, there the sons of Israel would camp. At the command of the Lord, the sons of Israel would set out, and at the command of the Lord, they would camp. As long as the cloud settled over the tabernacle, they reclaim, remained camped. Even when the cloud lingered over the tabernacle for many days, the sons of Israel would keep the Lord's charge and not set out. Verse 20, it sometimes, if sometimes the cloud remained a few days over the tabernacle, according to the command of the Lord, they remained camped. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. If sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning, when the cloud was lifted in the morning, they would move out. Or if it remained in the daytime and at night, whenever the cloud was lifted, they would set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a year that the cloud lingered over the tabernacle staying above it, the sons of Israel remained camped and did not set out. But when it was lifted, they did set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped. And at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the Lord's charge according to the command of the Lord through Moses. This was the leadership that God had given to Moses. And here in this portion of scripture, we see it's the first, uh, first description of God's willingness and the process to lead the Israelites through the wilderness. 
Now, the tabernacle is laid out here in this place, and God had a very specific plan for the, the tabernacle and how things were to be done. So, so I have a picture of what the, the area would look like uh, with the tabernacle in the middle. It's a dark picture on there and uh, has a fire coming out uh, from around it. But what would happen is that the tabernacle was there and the people, uh, you see the tabernacle in the middle, the fire of cloud, a fire of uh, uh, the fire at night, but all the tribes would, would place their tents around it so that they, would, they could see what was happening. If they walked out their tent, no matter their little world, their home, if they walked out of it, they could look out their tent and see what God was doing. There's so many things through this. The tabernacle instructions were given to Moses, and uh, Ezekiel Kaufman calls the tabernacle this. He says it's a priestly prophetic vehicle with the prophetic and the oracular predominate, uh, predominating. The illustrations performed in the tent are designed to make it fit for divine revelation, for law giving, for judgment, for guiding the, and for guiding the people through the desert. It became the hub of their world. All the laws, all the things, all the, the prerequisites of their life was about the tabernacle and about the, and it wasn't about the building, or about the tent. It wasn't about that, but it was about the presence of God. Within the tabernacle, God, who was before this unapproachable, the only person that was allowed to see him was Moses. And even at that point, Moses didn't get to see him because every time it was happening, a cloud would come in around Mount Sinai and Moses said, can I see you? And God says to him, well, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you. And when I pass by you, you will be able to see me as I go beyond. The ominous presence of God. It was within this tabernacle that God, who was unapproachable, Open the door to his people to communicate with him. The tabernacle represents God's willingness to enter into the world and communicate with his people. It was the place where Moses could meet, in essence, face to face with him. But not only within this set of scriptures do we see about the tabernacle, we also read about the cloud. The cloud. Now the cloud was associated with with both the the both of these the cloud by day and the fire pillar of fire was associated with the physical appearance of the deity or the appearance of God by day and by night and whenever the cloud was over the tabernacle they stayed camped right there because God's presence was there I always love that picture. Yeah, so here's the cloud by day, and then there's the, uh, the fire that leads you through, you know, the fire that leads them. But whenever the cloud was over there, they stayed, they, over the tower, they stayed, they camped there because God's presence was there. And when it was lifted, at whatever time of day that was, they were on the move. It could have been lifted in, at 2 o'clock in the morning, and when the, the fire was lifted and from that place, they would move, they would all get in and begin to move to the next spot. Just how it was. There was a pillar of fire to guide and direct them, giving them light to make it through. But this isn't the first time we see here in Numbers 9 where, where the, the cloud and fire are being introduced. Because it was, has been since, but this was, it hadn't been since Exodus chapter 40 that we saw this last time in Scripture. It says in Exodus 40, 34, that then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The temple was also known as the tent of meeting or the dwelling place. It's one of the reasons why in Toledo we named our church the dwelling place when we were there. And we had a tagline, a place to meet God. Other descriptions of the cloud and the pillar was this. It was the initial plans and the promise of the cloud and filth and fire came from Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 and 22. It says the Lord was going before them in a cloud by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by night and by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. He continually led them. 
It was a representation of the presence of God, the representing God to the people, saying, wow, when, when you see this cloud there, because it was a, a representation of the deity of who he was. That in Exodus 33, I'm sorry, uh, uh, in Exodus 19.9, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear you when I speak with you, and they may also believe in you forever. That God marked, the, even though the Israelites were, had been set free and followed Moses' leadership, it was the place where they were, they, they were waning in their ability to understand and they're waning in their ability to, to lead because they, they became selfish. They became about wetting their knees. Oh, we don't have enough food. We don't have enough for this. Why do we have to keep moving? Why do we have to set this thing up at night and tear it down in the morning? Or, you know, at, at some point, they're like, why is all this happening? And God said, don't worry, Moses, I'm going to set you apart. So when you come up to speak to me, I'm going to have a cloud go upon you. And that way the people will know that it's me speaking to you. And it's not just you. Because we all know pastors that, and leaders in our life that want it about them. And you can tell the difference about what, what anointing and gift and how you feel when you're around them. That's called the spirit of discernment that God gives to us. And we do that and say, it's not about us, but it's about what is God wanting to do. Moses was that kind of leader. How about Moses' role? And it speaks to this and the opportunity during the journey when the, the cloud would show up. In Exodus 33, verses 9 and 10, it says, Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. And the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship each at the entrance of his tent. This is even before the tabernacle. This is before God was pouring out his spirit in that place. And when they saw, this was before God gave it. So when Moses' tent as the leader of leading the exodus happening, when that happened, he would go and see the presence and, the, and they would have the glory would come down on them. And all the people would come out to the edge of their tent and they'd begin to worship God too. Because there was a leader that was leading them in that direction. And they're like, I want to, like, we're leading. This is how we do it. I mean, they hadn't seen the waters pulled back any other ways until Moses did it. 400 years living in captivity. And yet Moses leads them and suddenly they're set, they set free. And they're just following the example of worship. Spoke of Joshua there at that point where Joshua, son of Nun, went and he just, he was Moses' you know, protege and he just sat at the outside of his tent. And even when Moses left, Joshua just stayed right there because the glory and the presence of God was so strong. How about the cloud was a, as a, a protector to the priests and the Holy of Holies? I've already shared this to you in Leviticus 16.2. It says, the Lord said to Moses, I tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or he will die, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Psalm 105.39 later says that he spread a cloud for a covering and a fire to illuminate the night by night. Isaiah 4.5 says, then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke and the brightness of a flaming fire by night for over all the glory will be a canopy. I love that. I mean, can you picture that? That the glory of the Lord is a canopy. And I don't think he just wants the canopy over Kettering Assembly of God or Asbury or all these places. But God is saying, man, like that's where we enlarge our tents. God, let the canopy expand. Friend, can I encourage you today that the Lord is still speaking to us today. The tabernacle may not be a tent of meeting that is moving through the wilderness still today. And, and listen, I, I, as I was writing this, I was like, it may not be the wilderness, but it is still a wilderness today. I looked at Stacy the other day and I said, I feel like we're almost in the same place of all the craziness and where the world's at right now. Where the world's at, all the things going on that we feel like, man, there's this promised land of heaven that we're headed to, but we're living in a wilderness adventure today. 
And see, we need to know that it, it was never God's intention to just move in buildings and places. I shared this on Wednesday night in my Acts class, Acts 7, 47, 48, but it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. While we can study the tabernacle as an example of God moving in his leadership, it is not the answer for today. The tabernacle was the forerunner to the temple of Solomon's era. And the word of God speaks to the fact that you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That is the temple that follows the temple of Solomon's area. In 1 Corinthians six nineteen, it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God and that you are not your own. Hello. Some of you just need to hear that this morning. You are not your own. And, they, and, and when you realize that you're not your own, you, you begin to realize that the things that God's calling you to do are not because of you. Saying, God, I'm just choosing to be a faithful. I find it interesting that God didn't say that, uh, his scripture didn't say that your body is a house or a residence. Because how do you act at your house or your residence? You've got your easy chair. You got your flipper in the other hand, right? You, you got the comforts and the, you, lay, you let your hair down. You do all that for some of you. Some of us, praise the Lord. But he called it a temple because it's sacred. The temple is a sacred place where God is worshiped, revered and honored. That's who you are. And you, and you. That's who God's called you to be. See, God's plan for your life from the very beginning of time has been for you to be a temple of his presence, the carrier of his presence. But you need to know this, that today if you are not living your life for Jesus, if you have not been saved, if you have not surrendered your heart and life to Jesus, saying, Jesus, I need you. I give my life to you. I surrender myself to you. I give you all of who I am, my now, my, my tomorrow, my future. You are in control. Have your way within me. And, and, and friend, that prayer is just the beginning. It's not about being part of this church or any other church. To, be, uh, uh, to, to be, have entrance to heaven is not about membership in a church, but it's about, about confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that Jesus died and rose again. And when you do that, it says you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. But if you have not given your life to Jesus, what I am saying right now does not apply to you. This is void in your life because you are, there is a divide between you and God. Romans 8, 9 says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If you have not given your life to Jesus, the blessings of God will never be fully enacted in your life. His presence will never be within your life. That's what the scripture says. But what changes this? It's when we surrender our heart and our life to him then we verbally begin asking him to come into our heart to save us, to forgive us of our sin. And friend, that's where it begins. That's not the end. It's just the beginning. And, and it doesn't stop there. <laughs> I love what it says in Ephesians 4, uh, 1, 13 through 4. I told you I had a lot of scriptures. And I'm almost to my last page too. Praise the Lord, right? In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Friends, not only do we get the opportunity to have be a temple of the Holy Spirit, we also get to be sealed by God. 
We are sealed by his presence for the fulfillment of what's yet to come. That's why I say what is happening today is not even, it doesn't even scratch the itch of what's yet to come. Annabelle, in your walk with Jesus, your new walk with Jesus, every day he will open your eyes and he will make things new and he will make things great. And as you walk through that, you are sealed now by his spirit and by his presence because God so loved the world that he gave his only son for you. But why does he seal it? He seals it for the pledge of our inheritance. Ooh, come on, some of you, like I, my uncle just passed away and, and after he passed away, I worked with my mom and, and they, my grandfather was an insurance guy for Western Southern and my uncle had like policy never, number 1,200 of all Western Southern. Like now they're in the millions kind of thing, right? Uh, based out of Cincinnati. And I called in and it's been a long time since, you know, they had it. And I, but we had to, there was, a, there was a policy there as part of the inheritance that he was leaving to his family. And we look forward to, you know, at that point we had to pay for things and do stuff. And, but the blessing of the inheritance that's coming in, friends, the inheritance of the kingdom of God is nowhere near in comparison to some check coming in the mail or some house that you will obtain, or some vehicle that you will gain, or whatever it is that your family is passing down. That has no comparison to the inheritance that God is speaking here when we talk about heaven, because it says, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory, that God has called you for such a time as this. He didn't put Peter, he didn't put Paul, he didn't put any other disciples on the earth at this season and time to experience what he wants to do today. He chose you. And someday we're going to stand before Jesus and we're going to be in heaven and Peter and Paul are going to be like, dude, like they saw revelation of it. And they're going to say, what was it like? What was it like? See, we have not only been called to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, but the promise is so much more. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22, it says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set, us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is yet to come. Heather, you work at a bank? People put deposits in a bank and then they expect that you're going to, I mean, we don't expect much lately, but they expect to serve and get interest, right? Yeah, right. You expect when you go back to the bank that your money's going to be there. The government's created the FDIC and all these things to help make, you know, to affirm some of those things that, that your money will be there up to $250,000. So that's why you have multiple banks. Praise God. For those you can do it. I know. $250. Praise God. Let's do it. <laughs> Got a witness? Some of you teenagers, $2.50. Okay, let's just go for it. But when I go back to the bank, I expect that deposit, that money to still be there. But what I expect it to do is to grow. God has placed his seal upon you. He has given you the Holy Spirit, students, not for you just to come and stay the way you are but for you to learn what God's gifts, his talents, and his abilities are within you, and you allow it. That, why, like we want interest to grow in the bank. God's interest, the Holy Spirit's interest on that deposit within you is you finding out what the gifts and the talents and the abilities that God's given to you, and then you begin to use it. Right, Ellie? When you preach the word, that's the gift and talents and ability that God's using in you. Brad, that's the gift and talents within you guys. You know, Taylor, as you get up here and sing and go into town, come on. It's so good. I'm like, you know, this is the gifts and talents and abilities that we have. It's what God wants to do. We take it. And listen, friends, the word of God says it's a deposit guaranteeing. If anybody can guarantee it, do you think God can guarantee But he just doesn't say it one time. Guess what? He said it again. A couple chapters later in verse 5, verse 5, he says, Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is yet to come. In that setting, it's a little bit different. It says that we've been given the Holy Spirit as a deposit, 
guaranteeing what's to come. So if the Holy Spirit, which is one of the Trinity, the Godhead, has been given to us as a deposit, and it says, hey, listen, this is a deposit, but yet there is a guarantee for more yet to come? Friend, can I ask you what is about to come? And that is not a trumpet sounding outside. That's somebody's car. So don't worry. We're all still here in the trumpet. Yeah, we're jumping. We got practice. Let's do this. Those of you online here, you're like, what in the world is this guy doing? Just fall in the cloud, friend. Just fall in the spirit. Maybe be good stewards, right? No. But it's the down payment for what's yet to come. And not only do we see about the tabernacle, but we also see about the cloud and fire. And I'm just going to invite the team back up to come up at this point. But it says his cloud and his presence, his cloud and his presence, and he, he is still willing and still resting and fulfilling. He's still filling places with his presence. Let me say that. And, but it's the fire that's there. And today, friend, that fire may not go before us visibly like that, but the fire is the Holy Spirit that's within us. And God will speak to you, and he will lead you, and he will guide you. Once again, I go back to that ship that I have on my wall that says, I may not be able to control the wind, but I can choose to put up my sails. Friends, God is still speaking to us today. He is still leading us today. We are the, we, the tabernacle was meant to be moved. It was meant to be a, a temporary thing where God met, a place where God met, preparing for the temple, but ultimately the temple preparing you and I to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God is still speaking. He still wants to move. He's still guiding today. And I don't care what is going on in the world around us. If we will stop for just a moment and listen to where the Holy Spirit is leading us, we will be able to begin, begin to see the cloud of glory. And the cloud of glory may not be some physical cloud, but God can do it if he wants to. But in the midst of that, we'll begin to see people's lives beginning to change. And the presence of God is there. We'll begin to see a, a pillar of fire that goes before us that he says he's a light. The purpose of the fire was to light the path for the Israelites of where they were going. Friends, we don't have to live in this dark world on our own and, and try to figure it out. Where are we leading? We are not called to be blind believers. The Holy Spirit will lead us. He is guiding us. But the question is, are you willing to put your sails up? Are you willing to move when he says move? Because if you look through that scripture, through all through that section of scripture, next, uh, Numbers 9, 15 through 23, so many times in there it says that the Lord commanded. When the Lord commanded the cloud, they were to stay. When the Lord lifted the cloud, they were to move. When the Lord did it, every time he commanded what they were to do. And friends, that's the place where I want to be. I, I, I want us to be in a spot where we're not afraid to move when he tells us to move move that we're ready we're willing to go and do and be who he's called us to be and I don't know what that looks like and I, and I don't really care what it looks like on the end but what it looks like right now is we just say God here I am I'm surrendering myself to you and I'm looking for you to move and to lead me right now friend I can want that for our church and I can want that for you, but you have to want it for yourself. I can only want for you to the capacity of what you want for yourself. And our counseling and all those things, I can help lead you down the path, but if you don't want to change, if you don't want to apply, if you don't want to adapt, then our time, then that comes to the end of it. But can I ask you, what, what are you doing? cloud by, by day in his presence and, and sometimes the Holy Spirit's going to tell you just to stop and wait and sometimes we just need to stop in those moments and, and just Fermé la bouche right as the French is, is Kevin and you know Kevin in Home Alone they said shut your mouth sometimes you just need to shut your mouth and sit there and listen to what he's saying to you Dave, you gave testimony of that last week. And 
But then when that cloud moves, when he, when he says, all right, now it's time to go, you, you need to be able to get up and begin to go. The Holy Spirit will not lead you to a place that he won't take care of and protect and guide you. He will. He won't give you something more than, Scripture backs us up, he won't give you something more than what you can handle. But he will place you, as uh, Acts 1 8 says, to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He's going to put you in your comfort spots because you're called to be a temple, not called to be a house. Some of you got to get out of your comfort zones a little bit. Some of you need to surrender a little bit and say, today your first call is going to actually be, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. Because then, until that point, the temple of the Holy Spirit cannot be described by you. And, and, and it's not who you are. But God wants to call you his own. He wants to seal you. He wants to place a deposit within you. He wants to move in your heart and your life. And friends, some of you, you're, you're, you think like, I mean, the Holy Spirit has not diminished in your life. There's been a deposit inside of you of the Holy Spirit, and he is guaranteed to come back and get it. But some of you have been satisfied and fine with just knowing, well, I prayed in tongues one time. I'm good. Or I went on a mission trip one time, and, and I'm good. I did this one time, and I'm good. And God is saying, and, and maybe it was, you know, your testimonies, every testimony you give is, is, is like a month old or older. We need some yesterday testimonies. We need some today testimonies. It's great what God did in the past, but friends, what does the today and the future look like? I know God can move because I've read, read it throughout scripture that he can move in the past, but I want to see him with my own eyes. You want to change a generation? Adults, you want to you want to pass a church and a, the church off to the next generation, and, and you, you know grandparents and stuff. You want you want the next generation to have an understanding. Then let's create an environment that says, "Holy Spirit, you can move. God, you can move. Have your way." Let's create an environment that says, "We're putting our sails up in the air and say, God, wherever you want to blow, I'm willing. I'm ready." follow the current of the, the stream where you're leading. Friends, you are called and you are purposed and the head God does have a plan for you. But the question is, will you respond to that today? Will you allow him to lead you? And all I can say when all this is kind of wrapped up for me as, as, as your pastor, when I read through from Exodus all the way through Leviticus up to Numbers 9, 14, when I, when I talked about when God gave all those things, uh, there are times where God's going to speak to us clearly about things and places and what we're supposed to do. And, and he'll give us the plan and the task. And I, I want the clarity as much as you do. But sometimes he's just asking, will you take the next step? And that's how, we're, that's how I'm, I'm committing to lead to you. I'm willing to take the next step. I want to take the next step, but I don't want to take it by myself. So I'm asking today, I'm asking, will you join me? I'm asking, would you put your sails up and say, God, what are you going to do? It wasn't too many weeks ago that I sat at the, I laid on this altar in tears and boo-hooed in front of y'all because of God's presence. But I think part of the move is, for me, is just me as your leader getting out of the way and saying, God, you can do whatever you want. We've seen a lot of great things. We're seeing our church turn. We're seeing a lot of great things, but it's not about what we're doing, but me, but it's God, what are you doing through us? Church, I'm just asking you today, would you take the next step with me? Would you put your sails in the air? Would you, would you surrender again to him and say, I, Pastor, I don't understand all of it, but, but I trust if you're going to lead, we're, I'm going to follow. I'm going to go. We're going to go. I just want God to move. Friends, that's what I'm asking you today. There's nothing bad about coming to the altar. Because the altar just said, I'm getting out of my situation and I'm coming to a place and just consecrating myself 
before the Lord. And if you can't sit at the altar or come up and stand at the altar, you can. we've got seats on the front of the pews here that you can come in and come up and sit and just say, for just a moment this morning or this time that we're together, would you come? And say, I'm just going to follow. Lord, I'm going to follow your leading right now. I'm going to follow where you're guiding. I'm going to follow what you're doing, and I'm going to trust you, Jesus, today. I'm going to put my sail in the air and say, God, just begin to blow I need the freshness of your, your, your spirit and the freshness of your presence. Friend, if that's you, I just want to invite you to come this morning. I invite you to come and find a place. And maybe you just need to sit and rest for a moment. And maybe you, maybe you need to confess, oh God, forgive me for being about me. But God, today I'm here for you. Friend, when you're ready to be done and ready to move on, you're, you're welcome to go from there. I just, please not, don't have your conversation in here. You know, let's not, I, I want to see you back here tonight for, for worship. But right now, I want to invite you to come. Would you come and find a place at this altar? Would you come and put your sail up this morning and say, God, I, for right now, I'm going to rest in this place. I'm going to find you. I'm going to find your presence. I'm going to, I'm going to seek you because I'm hungry too. If that's you, I just want you to invite you to come right now. Let's fill this altar as we worship and call upon him and say, God, move me, move inside of me, melt my heart, move inside of me today. Come on, come on, come on.